So good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Namaste Village. It is Monday morning. I'm looking in the back of the room and I see the word imagination. This is the daily word for the day. I imagine and create wonderful blessings in my life. Thank you, Bethel, for putting that up. I imagine and create wonderful blessings in my life. The power of imagination. Both to remember who I am, to know where I am, and to not. You have to remember that the power of imagination works both ways. It works to remind us, to help us remember who we are, the truth that cannot change, but it also gives us the power to create a world that for a moment seems to be our home seems to be our identity, who we are, where we are, but in reality is nothing but a facade. That's the power of imagination. So now we learn to turn that power around, to imagine only that which is true, to see only that which is seen by God. The power of our imagination in reverse has been the power to see what is not seen by God. Do you see that? The power to not see what is true. And in doing so, we create a whole world that we inhabit, that only we can see. Because as we said last week, you're alone in this dream, the dream that you seem to be having, the dream of separation that you think you're sharing with so many people. The truth is, it's yours. It's the power of your imagination. I constantly remind myself that no one needs to get this but me. Sometimes I'm tempted to look out and say, how come they're not getting this? <laughs> How come they're not as excited about this as I would like to be myself? And then I remember, no one needs to get this but me because I'm alone in this dream. I'm, al I'm alone in this imagining of separation where I'm caught, I'm captive, I'm alone. But now we begin to turn that around. We begin to see that I'm never alone, and yet, in the dream, that's all there is, is aloneness. I am here to be as I have always been, to see as I am seen by God, to know that I am the holy, perfect child of God, complete and healed and whole, shining in the reflection of God's love. What other reason could there be at this point? I know that for each one of us, there's something that draws us here, that pulls us here every day. Not only those who live at Namaste Village, but those of you around the world who are here every day. There's something that's pulling you. Something's waking up inside you. And all this is doing is stirring that memory, helping you to reimagine. Because today's word is imagination. So we're here to reimagine the truth that has always been true. And in doing so, something begins to stir within us. Something slowly or even very quickly begins to wake up inside of us. And there's nothing in this world that quite compares. So follow that. Don't let that be just something that stirs within you when you sit in these seats. Let that take you like a wave into your life and remind you every ordinary moment of your life that there's only one reason for you to be here. There's only one thing for you to do, and that is to reimagine. You've used your imagination to turn it around, now let it turn back. It's like A Course in Miracles saying, just choose again. Just choose again. You've made a choice, yes, to, to imagine something that could never possibly be true. That you could be alone and separate and desperate and sinful and filled with fear. But you've imagined it very well. 
You're so good at it. Congratulations. <laughs> but what did it give you? What did you accomplish? It gave you a world where that fear seemed justified. It gave you an environment where you seemed to need to protect yourself from God knows what instead of living wholly present in this moment. So even though I know that this is only about me getting this, I also know that it's about me accepting this to such a degree that I can become a shining beacon, a vibratory example of what this reimagining is. So that when people come near me or come near you, they feel something. Something stirs within them. If you ever hang out with Johannes, I'm sure you feel that stir. Because it's stirring like a volcano inside her. And a volcano cannot help but erupt. A volcano cannot help but ex explode and spew grace in every direction. So once again, even though this is really just about me getting this wholly, fully, completely, I recognize that it is my call to be in service. It's my call to be the living vibratory example of that awakening. Once again, this is why we come here. This is why we join. It's not just to sit here and smile or and then just go back into our lives. It's to really do this, to really want this, to, to have a single desire for the expansion and the awakening into grace. It's the only thing I want. And as I realize that it is the only thing I want and commit myself to that one thing, that volcano begins to erupt. That's what causes that eruption, that single desire. What more is there? Well, I'll give you a, a little hint of, of one more thing that I think plays right into this, but it's a, a quote. I'm going to share a couple of quotes with you this morning. One of them comes from someone I've talked about a lot in the past. I haven't mentioned, mentioned Thomas Merton for a while, but those of you who know me know I, I'm a big Thomas Merton fan. And I, I came across something just a couple of days ago uh, in one of his books. I, I was listening to an audio book and I heard this one line and it just took me. So I want to share this with all of you. So let me go ahead and pull this up on the screen. <laughs> Thomas Merton, as you probably know, was a Trappist monk in Kentucky in the 20th century, probably the greatest spiritual writer of the 20th century. And he said, a tree gives glory to God by being a tree. A tree gives glory to God by being a tree. For in being what God means it to be, it is obeying God. A tree imitates God by being a tree. Did you hear that? A tree imitates God by being what it is, by being a tree. The more a tree is like itself, the more it is like God. That is some very simple, yet very heavy stuff. And I asked the question, this is not from Merton, but the question came to me, am I or are we being what God means us to be, like the tree? The tree that imitates God by being a tree. The more a tree is like itself, the more it is like God. Are we being who we really are, and in doing so, being like God? Because we have a choice every moment, don't we? We can be that, we can be as God imagines us to be, rather as God knows us to be. Because there is a step even beyond imagination, and that is the step into knowing I know this to be true. It is solid and whole within me. There is nothing that can shake it. 
I know that I am the holy, perfect child of God, and I'm going to vibrate that everywhere I go. Not to draw attention to me, but to thee. To draw attention to thee, to that sacred whole self at the center of each one of our beings. So that's the step even beyond imagination into knowledge, into certainty, into being a tree or to being wholly you, whole and you. So once again, are you being called? Are you being what God means you to be? It's a question that each one of us needs to answer, isn't it? Now, of course, the answer is going to fluctuate. It's going to variate. There are going to be moments when I look back and say, I was absolutely not being what God means me to be. I was not being my whole true self, which not only imitates God, but literally is that. That's what the name of God, Ehiye Asher Ehiye, I am that, means. It means you are being who you were intended to be. Not only imitating God, but realizing I am that. I am that I am. To erupt with that grace. So that that heat, the heat of that lava, burns away everything not like itself. And illumines the whole world. So when I came across that quote from Merton this or yesterday actually, I, I just I really wanted to share it because it just struck me. But then this morning I was reading an email and there was another quote that I found by Christine Walters Paintner, and she said, The God who calls us beyond our edges, the God who calls us beyond our edges is often a fierce presence creating a healthy sense of awe and trembling. The God who calls us beyond our edges. What are our edges? I believe that our edges, that's the identity that we've claimed. This is the edge. This is who I say I am. I say that I am a man. I say that I live in Mexico. I say that I'm a musician. There are a lot of things that I say I am. And all of those create an edge. And yet what she's saying is that the God that is calling you beyond those edges is fierce. It's not that that cushy, soft, fluffy God that we can experience in other ways. This is a fierce presence that is calling you from those identities, all of those ideas, because that's all they are, are ideas and concepts, is calling you from that in a fierce way, an active way. The only question then is, will you respond? Will you hear this message and then just go back and do what you've always done or think as you've always thought? Or will something spark in in you and you'll say, this is it. This is what I want. This is all there is. There's nothing more important to me than those being called to those edges, living through those edges, allowing that lava to build within me to such a point that it explodes and burns away everything not like itself. So, didn't think I was going to talk about all that this morning, but (laughs) it's erupting. (laughs) When it begins to erupt, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can say. Just follow it. Just let it go. And I know someone else who is is, is a rather good eruptor, (laughs) and that's Victoria Poppy. Good morning, Vicki. Good morning, would, Brother James. <laughs> I would love to feel your eruption this morning. <laughs> well, you sure hit a lot of buttons. But the first one that just erupted in my soul was realizing the frequency, and you talked about frequency, and Teddy talks about this all the time, the frequency of awakening, the frequency of the joy of the unknown, the frequency of really being free in being ourselves. That's the pitch that Namaste 
sends out. That's the pitch, hopefully, that many little circles of brothers all over the place are, are sending out. But it is surely the pitch and the frequency of awakening and the joy of awakening that is being sent out energetically, whether you're, we're on a Zoom call or not. It's, it's hitting the whole sonship. So I recognize that, and we all do. And, and this is our community, our family way of praying together to strengthen and stabilize only that identity and let the other stuff just fall away from neglect. But then the other thing that hit me, now imagination, that's a great word because it's a word that people regard highly even in the world. But the truth is we're done making stuff up. Imagination is making things up to suit this need or that idea or to be, you know, to make a big splash about this or about that. But real joy, joy comes when you don't want to make up anything anymore. You don't want to make up ourselves. I don't want to make up anything. But the, but what comes with the territory of no longer trying to make anything up is a literal flood of inspiration that is suited to our treeness, whatever our treeness is. So if my tree is to have a party, we're inspired to do a party in a couple of weeks. But if, you're in, you're, if your treeness is to write a song, you can't help but writing songs. But they don't come from imagination. They come from the source, I would say, of what imagination is. Almost like imagination it was a good, timely word that was a shadow of the greater source of spirit coming through no matter where we find ourselves, in or out of bodies. <clears throat> so no longer trying to make ourselves up, by, but by living by the, really the seat of our soul, by the inspirations that come from just being who we are and being open. And that's not something we teach, but it is something we emanate. And it's something we join hands in and we, it's like literally together facing the light, the sun together, until everyone's just allowing the same source to come through them to be their own treeness, whatever it is. And all we ever can do with that is appreciate it, enjoy it, celebrate it. And that is seeing with true eyes that see. Then there was one more thing I wanted to hit on. Oh, so yesterday, Teddy and I went to a beautiful memorial for a brother of ours that transitioned from physical to invisible. And it was very lovely. It was a lovely little memorial and it was relatively tame, but I, I couldn't help but explode myself with the joy of this is living on the edges. It was not faith, belief, and vision. There was such clarity and certainty that th his name, his given name at birth was Victory Blessing. Isn't that a great name? And you've met him when you've been here a few times. You won't remember him, but he's big, big presence and a presence of joy from the day he was born. He was born into a family that, that lived in the I Am consciousness many years ago in the 30s. He was in his 80s. So he grew up with that as his only identity. And he flourished in it. And he was a giver of joy wherever he went. But I could not help but express and experience the imminent presence of his beingness right where we were. It wasn't just, oh, you know, I, you know, I wonder what happens when someone dies and I hope they're here and I'm sure they are. It was such a knowing and a certainty of this presence abounding with joy. And, and I think everyone did feel it. So those are my experience around those those little themes and thank you for those quotes the wonderful quotes and oh, thank you for being present and emanating the joy of being the most wonderful blessed tree brother james <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and everyone else here too wonderful yeah. trees thank you we're all great trees aren't we <laughs> yeah and, and i completely agree with you about imagination it's a step and but the reason it's an important step is because we've used imagining to 
not see who we really are. We, we have imagined ourselves to be weak. We've imagined ourselves to be vulnerable, to be separate. And we turn that around until we come to that point that you described of total knowing, where the tumblers fall into place. Now imagination is no longer required. That's where we are now. We have turned it around. The tumblers have fallen into place. We now see what has always been seen by God. We now know what has always been known by God. And in doing so, that eruption begins to stir. That light begins to move. That fire begins to build. And now all we do is just extend. Now all we do is share. Because that's what God does. That's the only thing there's left to do. So thank you, my dear Vicki. Is Teddy there with you? It's right upstairs. I'm outside. Are you there, Teddy? <laughs> okay, let me, let me try up. Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is like the Brady Bunch beginning where there are all the squares. Good morning, Teddy. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so it is. It's what you were just saying is true. Imagination is post-schism. It's post-separation. And we've used it to try to imagine a condition unlike we were created to be. We cannot not be as God created us because that's all there is to be. It's total, whole, and perfect. Um, so imagination is post-schism. We've used it to make up a world, and that's why this is an illusion in that sense, um, because we've imagined being separate from God, and our imagination has attempted to make that true. And that's what the world is. That's simply it. Um, and there is a point in time where you're sick and tired of imagining things because they're always disappearing and you just want to know the truth. And in that moment, you know, maybe it does dawn on you and you see how wrong you've been about even imagining how good God is. Um, because here we, we, we can't do it other than based on comparisons, and all comparisons are false. Um, and then the other thing is Thomas Merton. I read, I really love Thomas Merton myself. Um, and one of the things that I was certain of based on his presence and some of the things he said in articles and in magazines and things like that, rather than in his books, was that he had the experience of reality and he knew exactly what it is and what it was. But he was really, really also part of an order and he had to live within the lines of that order. So sometimes his writings in his books are a bit of a reduction so that he could stay in the lanes of the order he was part of, um, which was always interesting to me. because uh, And that takes discipline. Uh, and that's what he committed himself to. So I know Merton, for a fact, had an experience of totality and reality. Um, you could see it in him. You could hear it in him. But I also know that on occasion, his writings were a reduction. Like, I'm sure if you asked Thomas Merton about a tree, he would tell you none of this exists in reality. But he uses it as a way of trying to express something and um, to stay between the lines of the fact that there is an order that he's part of. Um, so, but Thomas Merton definitely, he, he, he was the real deal. Yeah. That's all I can say. Yeah, you're probably right. Merton had an experience when he was walking uh, down the street in Louisville, Kentucky, where the tumblers fell into place. There's no other way to describe it. It's just suddenly, just like that. Everything, he saw everyone, he saw everything around him as wholly one with who, the truth of who he was, the truth of who he knew himself to be. Just in an instant, the, the veil fell. And, and, and that's as God knew him to be. 
and as God knows each one of us to be. He also had probably the most dramatic story of going into the light uh, in a bit of an unfortunate way um, than most of us, hopefully. Uh, he was called, remember, he had not left uh, the monastery for, for decades, but he was called to, uh, to travel to Thailand, I believe it was, where he was uh, to give a, 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 a speech, a talk at a conference for um, contemplatives from all the different religious traditions. He gave probably the most important talk of his life, uh, went to his room, uh, took a shower or a bath, uh, the, the lamp or the light fell into it and he was electrocuted <laughs> immediately following his talk. Yeah, interesting, eh? Who knows? Who knows how these things work? <laughs> and I'm not encouraging this by any means. <laughs> There, there are other more simple, more gentle ways of, of expanding into the light than what Thomas Merton experienced. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Teddy. Thanks to all of you. What a beautiful way to begin our day, or for those of you who are well into your day, to, to spark this moment, this, this step even beyond imagination into certainty. That's all this is, is we are called to be certain of what is really happening here, who we are and where we are. To realize that each one of us is the holy, perfect child of God, complete and healed and whole, shining in the reflection of God's love right now. To not hold that back, to dive into that. Because if you really know that that's true, not just believe, because there's a big difference between believing something is true and knowing something is true. When you really know that, nothing will hold you back. You will want nothing but the expression of love through and th to and through you in every moment. And that's where we are. That's the point at which we've come. So now... Let's go. Let's do this. And that being said, we're going to go ahead and end the recording. I love all of you who are watching this on YouTube. I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day and join us live. We'll see you then.